can you eat a stained glass window? How can a worm help your dustbin man? How can you detune an orchestra? I lift an ice cube simply with the aid of a matchstick. A physical and mathematical impossibility, you can't. No, no, you need a pair of grips to lift a, no, an no, ice no, cube, no, no. really. Simply with a matchstick. Now, you place the matchstick over the ice cube. Yes. You also need a little bit of salt. Ah, you should you yourself in the No, I haven't. No, 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 I haven't. You pour the salt, salt on top. The salt will melt the ice like it does on the roads in the winter. Exactly what it does on the roads in the winter. It does melt the ice, yes. but then it sucks up the salty water, you see. And if your ice cube is cold enough, it will then freeze that salty water on top. And so you should be able to simply lift the ice cube like nice. So. Nice theory. Do it. I thank you. That is how you lift an ice cube with the aid of a simple little matchstick. How can you avoid a jam? What do you mean? A, a traffic sort a of traffic jam? Well, jam. Well, you can't yeah. because, you see, you're going along in the traffic, you just come to the jam and that's it. You're stuck, aren't yeah. you? I bet you know how, don't you? Well, I do, actually. Well, I thought you might. Um, now, have you guys been out in your cars recently and, yeah. uh, and seen on the motorways these things being mounted on motorway bridges? It's actually an infrared sensor that emits two infrared beams. What's it for? How does it work? Come over here and I'll show you. Um, now, just imagine for a moment, this is Britain's motorway network, OK? And imagine this coat hook here is one of those infrared sensors, OK? Right, what happens is... I'm driving around the motorways, it's a nice, um, legitimate and legal 70 miles per hour, and the infrared sensor measures the time it takes for my car to pass through the two beams. And the t because it knows the time it takes to pass through those beams, it can work out the speed I'm doing. OK, but what happens if there's more traffic on the motorway? I'll add a slightly slower car to the motorway there like that, right? And, well, more traffic on the motorway and the speed of the traffic slows down a little bit. The infrared sensors measure that speed, but if the speed of the traffic slows right down to 30 miles per hour or less, or even stops, the infrared sensor sends a signal back to a central control yes, centre. Yes, but Toppy, that's all very well, you see. Back in central control, they mm -hmm. know exactly. there's a traffic jam. Of course but they the do. people in the cars who are driving around the motorway, they don't know, they do don't they? Know. Ah, no, she's right, Toppy. Not unless you have got one of these things in your car. This is actually a radio receiver with a graphic display, and it's receiving signals from the central control centre. And you can um, ask it to display on its little map here the part of Britain that you are driving in. Let's have a look now. It's actually showing at the moment. Can we see there? That is the M11 at junction 7. You can see, look, see those arrows? That's the direction that the traffic is travelling in, going north there. You can see it north mile per hour going south, 20 mile per hour and 30 mile per hour. Oh, look at this, 10, 5 and 0. It comes to an absolute halt there. So if you had one of these in your car, you would know to avoid that particular part of the motorway. And using new technology, that's how you could avoid a jam. How can you eat a stained glass window? You can't possibly eat a stained glass window. No. It is extremely dangerous you, and not advisable. You can eat a stained glass window. It's just that you probably you cut yourself to ribbons. No, you, you must do you not mind, do you mind do if it. I start? This is a brilliant culinary howl involving a fair amount of skill. Therefore, I am obviously the man for it. <laughs> you will need some pastry, OK? Yeah. There's a degree of skill in doing this, as you well know. What, rolling it? Absolutely. It's got to be done. Nice and nice and precise. Very good, though. Probably. Having got your pastry, mm. you then need to cut your shape, the desired shape of your window, out of the pastry. Now, because oh. I can't hang around here, I'm clearly going for a fairly simple kind of An shape. An arch shape. OK, yes. yes. Get rid of that, because that is no longer required. And in here, you will cut out the shapes of the sort of windows you want. Fairly artistic? Yes. Yeah, but it's hardly stained glass, Fred. <laughs> not yet, Toppy, not yet. Here's one I prepared a little earlier, slightly more artistic than the one I was mm. just doing. 
Okay. A lot better. Yeah, yeah. That's what the about shape. The windows. What about the yes. stained glass? <laughs> to make your stained glass windows, you will need some boiled sweets. What do you mean boiled? How? You also need a hammer. Ah. Smash them up. <laughs> Smashed boiled sweets equals stained glass windows. How? Get your little pallet and your little bowls and put your boiled broken sweets into the shapes, wherever you want them, different colours, a little bit of yellow mm -hmm. and orange in that window there, a nice lime colour perhaps in the centre. These are all boiled white. sweets, These are, are all boiled sweets. That looks very pretty. A bit of mm. pink and so on and so on, OK? Until it's now time for the really exciting bit because you take your stained glass window and put it in the oven. 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. OK. In it goes. And out comes rather a beautiful thing. Like that. The sweets have melted. The pastry has cooked. Oh. Are you still following? Yeah, I am, yeah. yes. Right. But okay. the thing about stained glass windows yes. is yes. that they are absolutely fantastic when the sun is streaming yes. through the yes, house. Yes, they, they are. are. Beautiful. Yes, they are. And I can show you all that. And also the beautiful shapes that you can make. There you are. What about that? Yay. Not only do they look good, they also taste good. And that is how you can eat a stained glass window. Lovely. Mm. How can a worm help your dustbin man? Daft worms aren't strong enough to. No, no, Fred. If you train a thousand worms, they can actually physically no, pick up the no, bin and carry no, it away. No, and no, they can drive no, trucks these. Yes. No. A family, on average, produces over a ton of rubbish every single year. But there's a lot of stuff that we can recycle. We can recycle bottles, for instance. Just take them to the bottle banks. We can recycle cans. Take those to the banks as well. And of course, we can recycle newspapers and comics. Fairly unrevealing so far, Borders. What about rotting veg and stuff like mm. that? You see, food always has been a problem to get rid of. See, if you just leave it, it does rot and it gives off a very, very smelly, stinky gas known as methane. And this is where the worm can help out. You see, this worm here, this is known as a tiger worm. It's a British worm. And these worms love to chomp their way through food waste. Now this dustbin may look like an ordinary dustbin to you. It is in fact a wormery. And all you do to use it is you put the worms into the wormery and you simply put your food waste on top of that and leave it all to cook. And once it has cooked, this is what happens. The worms eat their way and chomp their way quite merrily through the vegetable and the food waste. And they make this gorgeous, rich, clean, dry compost, which you can just put onto your rose bushes or on the garden at home. They also give off a liquid which seeps down to the bottom of the wormery. And to get rid of that, all you do is simply open the tap at the bottom, collect the liquid, and pour it onto your plants at home because it's full of goodness and nutrients. What about the how? How does it help a dustman? Come on, Carol. Well, if we recycle more, mm -hmm. then the dustman has less to carry and his job is far less smelly and nasty. Oh. And that is how the humble worm can help your dustbin man. How can you detune an orchestra? OK, before I get into orchestras, let me show you something about the generation of sound and musical notes. You've probably done this yourself in school. If you take a ruler and put it on the edge of a desk and twang it, it makes a sound. And as you shorten the ruler, the sound gets higher. The shorter the ruler, the higher the sound. It's exactly the same for the orchestra. Take the example of the string instrument, in this case, the beautiful cello. Now then, um, it's exactly the same with the cello. If I make a note from the cello, it's the string which is vibrating. And if I shorten that string, the higher the note. The shorter the string, higher the note. Now then, on to woodwind or wind instruments. Um, and I've chosen the most beautiful of wind instruments, 
the Swanee whistle. Now, in this occasion, <laughs> it's actually a column of air which is vibrating, that column of air there. Now, as I make it shorter by moving this plunger up the whistle, it oscillates or vibrates at a higher frequency, and the note gets higher. The shorter the column, the higher the note. You get this effect. <whistles> the shorter the column, the higher the note. And now, on to percussion. And the most gorgeous of the percussion instruments, I think, is, of course, the tubular bells. Toppy, they are copper pipes. Copper pipes they are copper. not tubular Yeah, I'm right. They're not real tubular bells, but they do do the same thing. Now then, the shorter the pipe, the higher the note. The shorter the pipe, the higher the note. So, what will happen, Carol, Fred, mm -hmm. yeah. if I hit this tubular bell... Copper pipe. All right. ...into um, a vat of water, now, what will happen to the note? Higher. Well, the shorter the pipe, the, the higher, higher the, the note. Yeah, the yeah, shorter the pipe, the higher the note. OK, yeah. listen to this. <laughs> oh. Did you hear that? Listen again. I'll tap it longer for you. Listen. The note gets lower, but why? Well, the answer is the medium in which the vibration is happening. Normally, this tubular bell is vibrating in air. You lower it into water, and it has to vibrate at a different frequency, simply because water is thicker. That's fantastic, but what about the, uh, what about the how? Well, how do you detune an orchestra? Yeah, how do you detune an orchestra? Yes, how do you do yeah. detune an orchestra? Well, that's easy. If you want to detune an orchestra, all you have to do is get the entire orchestra to play in a swimming pool. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> and so to the very last how. How difficult is it to throw a pot? <laughs> it's uh, not very difficult at all. You just pick it up and Right, you not very it. difficult. Yeah, you should smash it with one good lob. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know how to do it, but I know a man who can. Well, the man to show us how is John Gooding, Master Potter. John, I don't want one of your beautiful works of art. I want a simple pot exactly like that. Okay. How do we do that? Right. Well, I'll take you through the few stages necessary to make it. Lovely. So, what do we start with? We start with a ball of clay, about two pounds weight, and plonk it in the middle of the wheel head. All right. Then lots of water, and with the wheel head going quickly, we centre the clay. We're trying to produce a disc of clay perfectly centred on the wheel head, like that. Drop a hole in the middle of the clay down nearly to the wheel head. Middle finger a hole in the centre of the clay, but not all the way through to the bottom. No, otherwise the pot wouldn't have a bottom in it. A bottomless pot. So the next step is to open out the clay, forming the bottom of the pot. And it begins to take a pot shape. So I bring in the sides of the pot and form a squat cylinder. OK. And I use that part of the knuckle to raise the wall of the pot. OK, so that stage is bring in the sides and use the knuckle to raise the sides of the pot. That's right. OK. A little bit more water. There you are, a simple flower pot. Absolutely superb. John, that's exactly what I needed to know. Excellent. And now, live from the studios of the Vorderman Corporation, it's the How Game Show! And here is your host, Fred Tiny! Hi, hi, hi! Welcome, little lady. You know what you've got to do? You've got to make yourself a pot. You know what pots mean, Sonny? What Prizes. do pots mean? Prizes! Good boy! You've got a minute to make a pot starting from now. OK! Get it dead centre and away you go. That's the stuff. Lots of water, lots, lots of, water. of action, a little bit of power. <laughs> OK, and how are we doing? Not bad. OK. You learn from me, you won't go too far wrong. OK, just follow me, OK? Yeah. How are we doing? Ah, OK. Lovely jubbly. Well, there we are, Toppy. Not bad at all. Carol, absolutely rubbish. So that's how difficult it is 
to throw a pot, and that is how for now. <laughs>